welcome to another episode of Wrestle, uh, sort of a companion piece to our weekly Wrestling Renegades podcast. I am Zach, who is here to say that Daniel Bryan may be the greatest of all time, the GOAT, but I am the greatest of all talk. Uh, and because of that, I have to apologize to my co-host, Paul. Uh, hello. I Yes, I might actually challenge you for that one. <laughs> I mean, I guess you have the podcast network, but I'm the one who thought of that. So <laughs> I'll let you have it this. He might time. be the goat, but I am. I'm, I'll okay, let, I'll let you have it this time. But maybe uh, one day we'll have to have to wrestle it out. No pun intended for for that title. Okay, well, I mean, hey, uh, if you feel your chances are good, I mean, take your shot, buddy. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we are, as of this recording, uh, a little less than a week out from WrestleMania 34. And the biggest storyline, I think, going into WrestleMania this year uh, is the return of Daniel Bryan to the ring, not in a managerial role or as a special guest referee or anything like that, but as an actual legitimate competitor. He was just cleared a couple weeks ago. And Paul, you had made mention that you had never seen any Daniel Bryan stuff before. Nothing. By the time I was leaving wrestling a little over a decade ago, he was uh, I want he was he was in the Indies and I know that only because of uh, certain things that we're about to to talk about. But I wasn't really like an indie person then. I was strictly WWE and like obviously you know old ECW and WCW stuff. I knew of Ring of Honor, um, but I never really watched much of it. New Japan wasn't nearly as big as it is now. Then I was gone for a while, and then not long after. He, Uh, Daniel Bryan announced his retirement because I remember seeing that like that made some more national news stuff because it brought to light, you know, all of like the concussion based stuff and basically anything negative uh, to get WWE in the press always makes some more national news stuff. So I remember seeing that and talking with you and like our friend Brian and things like that. And so it was probably not long after he retired that I was getting back into it. Cause that would have been right around WrestleMania 31, I want to say. And I got right into it right around 32. So maybe a year after. Okay. Yeah. Cause Daniel Bryan's last WrestleMania, uh, match was at WrestleMania 31. He was in the intercontinental title ladder match, which he won. I think. Yeah, he won the Intercontinental title that night, and then, like, I don't know, it was, like, a couple months later, I think, where, like, he was injured again, and that was basically it. That was that was it for him. Uh, until recently, uh, just, I don't know, miracles happen sometimes, and Daniel Bryan has finally cleared uh, WWE's concussion protocol. He's he's fit to return to the ring, albeit with some, with some, with some restri- restrictions, so I guess after every match, he's going to go through the concussion protocol to make sure he's okay. Um, but anyway... This is a small series uh, of of uh, wrestle mini podcasts uh, that uh, we are calling "Chase the American Dragon." Uh, that is Daniel Bryan's, you know, most famous moniker, especially on the independent scene. And uh, you know, I'm a little unfamiliar with Daniel Bryan, or as the case may be, Bryan Danielson's independent work. Uh, I had just kind of started getting back into wrestling about WrestleMania 30. So I missed a lot of his WWE run up until that point, and I definitely didn't see any of his independent stuff. So I figured we're about a week out from Brian making his return to the ring. You're going to see him live in the ring for the first time. Uh, Who knows in what kind of match. I'm assuming a handicap match or something. But I figured this was a good time for us to take a look back at some of his his best matches. You know, uh, I just sort of perused the internet and found some interesting matchups. A lot of them... Uh, kind of my goal was uh, picking matches he's had with people. A lot of it's in Ring of Honor. Actually, I think all of it is. Um, matches he could have today. He could have rematches with these people today because his opponents at the time are now in WWE. So AJ Styles, uh, Kenta, now known as Hideo Itami, uh, Tyler Black, now known as Seth Rollins, and the subject of uh, this, this first installment, Brian Danielson versus Samoa Joe. At Ring of Honor Midnight Express Reunion 2004, uh, Samoa Joe went in as champion. And uh, what did what did you think of this, Paul? This was I thought this was great. Um, I I mean I've I've liked Joe for a long time. I don't 
I, his his Ring of Honor run obviously has to be before he was in TNA, and I had seen some of his stuff from TNA, especially like that run that he had, like with uh, Kurt Angle and AJ Styles, and you know like when when TNA was probably at its peak, its hottest point. So I mean, any Samoa Joe match is going to be a good match. Uh, I wrote down a few things. Uh, I liked the match. I actually got to learn a little bit more about Ring of Honor because I haven't watched a lot of their stuff. Like I saw that there's they don't have like a 10 count on the outside of the ring, but there can yes. be a disqualification, things like that. Um, it was also weird because they had this was an older match and they had uh, almost like the boxing type setup. They didn't have turnbuckles. They just had like the straight. I don't know what you would call those, like just the straight padding across all three sets of ropes. I thought that was a little interesting. Um, yes. I wrote, uh, I was surprised at Brian's wrestling style. At first, I thought the way everyone talked, he used and abused his head more. I specifically looked for blows to the head, and there weren't many that stuck out. But then as the match went on, it became more apparent. And it was a little... I don't want to say unnerving, but it was a little because knowing what I know and how a lot of that was the cause of so many problems in his life, especially for the last few years, like while he's been away from the ring and he's been trying this, obviously while he was in the ring, you know, he was clearly suffering from a lot of stuff that wasn't talked about until after he was done. But just knowing that that all sort of contributed to stuff, it was not full cringeworthy but almost like it was uh we and we talked about this on the wrestling renegades proper um when uh zane and owens attacked him that first night when he announced like i'm able to come back and everybody sort of had to hold their breath because they're like oh my god they're it really looks like they're going for it and even that was as you said on on the show when we talked about that that was like not as bad because you could see like they were protecting certain things but at this at the point of this match with Samoa Joe they didn't know any of that so he was just full on going for everything so it was a little cringeworthy um but I wrote they both showed heel tendencies now I don't know was Daniel Bryan or Brian Danielson a heel on the indies I don't know if you're if you know this either but he's he showed a lot of heel tendencies and maybe uh, because Ring of Honor tends to focus uh, more on the wrestling aspect. You know, they have to, the sports aspect, I should say. You know, they shake hands before every match. And there's a lot of um, mat based style, like the catch as catch can, you know, submission to submission to submission style. There was a lot of the strong style stuff. Um, but they didn't, they, they were both being cheered. They were both being booed at certain points. Brian Danielson throwing around f bombs. The crowd yes. throwing around f bombs. Yeah, Brian drops the f bomb is one of my notes because I thought that he was legally incapable of saying that. <laughs> but yeah, no. Overall, I really liked the match. It was, uh, you know, technically speaking, this is the first Daniel Bryan Brian Danielson match I've ever seen, and. It was a great way to start. It showed a lot. Like, I was really, really impressed. And, you know, it's one of those things where if every match is this good, I I mean, obviously I'm pumped to see what is going to happen at WrestleMania. I'm a bit of a WrestleMania mark, as we know. I mean, I'm a bit of a mark in general for wrestling, which I don't think is a bad thing, but I'm a bit of a WrestleMania mark, so you know they're going to they're gonna pull out the big guns for not only the fact that it's Mania, but the fact that it's his first match back. But just seeing this, I'm wondering how much his style is going to change, if at all. I mean, it has to change a little bit, obviously, but I hope it doesn't deviate too much from this because this was just a fantastic match overall. Yeah, you know, and and my first note is this match is a great example of how Brian can hang with someone bigger and tougher than him. Um because like it's a lot of technical he's very technical and he works the limbs and so like that's kind of his bread and butter. So I think he'll he'll keep with that um because like that's the only way he can really go against Samoa Joe, the commentary even makes note 
Uh, and by the way, you could find this match on YouTube. I try to keep it so you could find these matches easily online if you want to watch them yourselves. Um, they even mentioned on the commentary, you know, if Danielson goes strike for strike, blow for blow at Samoa Joe, he's going to lose. But you see Danielson, he's working the leg of Samoa Joe. You know, he's trying to take out his base because Samoa Joe has a lot of those kicks. He's also kind of, he's real fast for someone his size. So Daniel Bryan with his technical mastery and his, you know, his his mat genius, I could see him hanging with Samoa Joe today. Or, you know, people are like, oh, he should face Brock Lesnar. And I don't want that to happen because Brock will murder him, shoot murder him, okay? But it shows that he wouldn't immediately die in that match. He could, he can outsmart, he can outwrestle his opponents. It made me think two things. One about each person. Uh, you said about the fact that, uh, whatever, we'll, I'll just say Daniel Bryan, that he is, you know, much more mat based. And like I said, it, it reminded me of like that catches catch can, like that, that British style of wrestling that I was, when I was especially first getting back into it, watching uh, WCW, WCPW at the time now known as Defiant Wrestling. When I was really heavy into that, they were, they were doing a lot of that because that, that is more of like a, a, you don't see that that much, at least in like WWE, you don't see a lot of that you know, mat wrestling and, and going for a lot of submission holds and, you know, going from move to move to move to move. There's a lot of, you know, like, uh, oh, let me go for a shoulder tackle or let me go off the ropes versus I'm going to like a Zack Sabre Jr. almost where it's like, I'm going to make you, you know, I'm going to twist you from this move. You're going to twist me into that move and then I'm going to twist you back and so on and so forth. And that could go on for like 10 minutes. Um, so I really like that. You know, and it's it, not to cut in, uh, not not to cut you off, but uh, it surprises me that that style isn't used more in like WWE because like almost every time it's used, it's in like a big match situation, you know, and the crowd eats it up. Yeah, well, I think I mean I think it's a good thing that they do only because it's like it may be because it's something they don't get to see very often. You know, it's not uh, the five moves of doom. And I don't necessarily mean that as, as you know, to anybody because that could, you know, people say that about Bret Hart, John Cena, you know what I mean? So uh, uh, Diesel, Kevin Nash. Um, but maybe it's just because it's not those sort of things that it's like, oh, this is a, a change. And this is and especially if you're strictly WWE, which I don't know how their fan base goes, whether it's, you know, a larger portion is just WWE or if a larger portion knows more wrestling overall. But I like because I because well you and I we we both know many different promotions around the world. We we don't watch all of them week to week or keep up with all of them as much as we do maybe with WWE. But we could at least go and say like, hey, you know, if you we could say to somebody like our friend Mark at work who who, you know, actually just is getting out of wrestling now. But we could say, oh, to him, he? well, yeah, because he got he got upset about the 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 fact that it's too soap opera now. It's it's too <laughs> evident that it's and I'm like, it's always been that way. Always. <laughs> right. Um. But right. we could say to him, like, hey, you know, if you actually like the wrestling more, we could recommend to him other things like this. And he may look at it and say, oh, well, I don't like this style. I may not. He may not like the strong style like the Japanese have or like that technical style like, uh, you know, the, the UK has or whatever. But I mean, it's everybody's it's everybody's different thing. And it's funny because I've talked with you about it several times. The fact that my favorite era of wrestling, of course is the Attitude Era, where there wasn't a lot of wrestling going on. So I always say that I always like the storylines in wrestling better, because I like just a good storyline. Like, even if it is very soap opera-y, I used to watch soap operas. So I, I, I like that dramatic stuff. But when it comes to actual wrestling... I like to watch a lot more of this like map based style. And it was really interesting seeing Samoa Joe sort of go for that because even though he is a bit of a bigger guy, he tends to do a lot more. Uh, he, he does a lot of striking, but he's also very agile for somebody of his size. And this was the other thing that, that this match made me think. And apparently they have on the indies, which I'm not surprised. 
but I was like, oh, I wonder if Samoa Joe has ever gone against Kevin Steen or Kevin Owens, which I think he has in WWE even. They faced each other. But like on the indies, because they can do a lot more, like that's a match that I would love to go back and watch because they're just two bigger guys that are more agile than they look or than you think they would be. And that just made me want to go watch one of their matches as well. Well, Samoa Joe is currently injured, so I guess, you know, if he comes back, we could do another series of videos or, or mini podcasts and watch Samoa Joe matches. I'm all I'm all about that. Yeah. But uh, it showed that Daniel Bryan also, like, you know, Daniel Bryan had the mat, the mat uh, wrestling, but also he, uh, he pulled off some power moves. So, like, the guy's a lot stronger than you might think, you know. Because, like, when he's up against someone like Samoa Joe, he looks like he's a smaller dude, because he is. But it, it betray, you know, it, it doesn't betray the fact that, like, he's 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 pretty stocky. It's funny because of the fact that he's smaller. And when they, I believe in that match, they said he was uh, 199 pounds. And I remember when it was first being talked about that he was coming back because uh, it was announced on WWE's website, uh, you know, at first. And then everybody on the internet picked it up. And then later that night, he got to announce it himself in the ring. And uh, people were saying, especially because of the fact that WWE has theoretically held him down so much, some a uh, few people speculated that he may be forced to join 205 Live because he, I don't know what his, you know, what they're going to bill his weight as now. But they may, you know, it's like, oh, they may for, force him to join 205 Live. And, like, the people who said that immediately when talking just, like, at the camera or if they were in videos or, or anything like that with anybody else or even in a few articles I read, they were all just like, oh, yeah, maybe this will happen. Dear God, I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> so yeah, it'll be yeah. really good to see, like you said, maybe against a Brock Lesnar. And I'm not necessarily saying that I would want to see that match, although, to be fair... I didn't think Brock Lesnar versus AJ Styles was going to be good because I thought Lesnar would just murder Styles as well. But he actually put in the effort with Styles at the was it SummerSlam match I think they had just this past year. So um, that was actually really good. But I still would not necessarily want to see Brock versus Daniel Bryan. Maybe My only, my only concern would be all those German suplexes, which makes up 98% of Brock Lesnar's offense. I don't really want to see um, Daniel Bryan dropped on his head like several times in a match. Which is, That's the reason I don't want to see it. Not because I don't think Daniel Bryan could put in any believable offense. It's because I'm not sure Daniel Bryan would survive. Right. I would like to see, and I mean, maybe I'll get some hate for this on the internet, but I, I, I might actually like to see uh, Daniel Bryan versus Roman Reigns. I don't know if they if they ever had the chance to meet up before he retired, but um, just in terms of, Ro especially the, the push that Roman Reigns has in WWE as the big dog, trademark, um, and you know, like almost, especially once once we believe he's going to beat Brock Lesnar this coming Sunday, uh, once that happens and he has slayed the beast and, you know, he'll have, he'll have run through Lesnar. He'll have run through, uh, the undertaker. He's beaten John Cena a few times. You know what I mean? Like all oh, triple H, all of these people. And they're just trying to, to have him as the big guy. Even if Brian doesn't beat reigns, even if he could at least hold his own and so that they both come out looking strong, I wouldn't mind watching that match to be completely honest. Yeah. You know, if you've never, if you, if you think the heat that Roman Reigns gets is, is too uh, minimal. I mean, that's going to be like the crowd's going to throw garbage at Roman Reigns. Like it, the crowd feels very strongly about this Daniel Bryan guy. <laughs> uh, you may have noticed. Yeah. Well, like I said, that's why even and if Roman it's a, Reigns, yeah. they feel very strongly about him. But I mean, even if it's a matter of, and I, we've seen this, this many times where like, even let's just say Lesnar versus Styles, right? Lesnar came out on top, but Styles didn't look weak at the end of it. You know, they, and I mean, we've seen that with, with several different matchups and I think if they if they mapped out the match right, I think they could do it. Whether they want to get Reigns booed or whatever, you know, I think it just all that mattered to all that would matter to me is making sure that they both look strong 
when they you know, like when the match is over. It doesn't matter because we know in WWE wins and losses don't matter. To me, it's as long as they both come out strong because then in a few months, if you want Daniel Bryan to be on SmackDown and go for the WWE title, whereas Roman Reigns has the Universal title, he at least, I mean, yes, he's already been world champion and whatever, but he at least is, you know, at that caliber because then the announcers could even say, well, you know, a few months ago, let's not forget, he went up against the big dog and he, you know, he still showed a lot of heart and the WWE universe was still behind him and all of that stuff. And it, we would actually know that it was true versus just Michael Cole or Corey Graves or whoever just blowing smoke, no pun intended because of the dragon thing, but you know what I mean? Just, just blowing smoke because they want to rewrite history. If they did it right, they could, you know, they would actually have us, the Smark fans being like, oh wow, they're actually being like legitimate right now, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, should he ever go against Roman Reigns, I don't have any beliefs that he'd actually beat Roman Reigns, but I think it would be a close and it would it would only help, you know, Daniel Bryan in the eyes of people who aren't already in love with him as a as a performer. Uh, you know, he's been gone for two years. There there might be new fans that have no idea who he is other than the bearded guy who uh, runs SmackDown. That was another um, weird thing about this match was seeing him without the beard. And yes, no hair bald. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just it's it's so bizarre because I'm used to just like the long hair and the beard and stuff. Um, also, the, again, he 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 dropped the f bomb, and I'm just like, what, what, is that even allowed? See, well, the, at the one point, I believe it was in that match, or maybe it was uh, one of the others that we're going to be talking about. I'm not sure, but he, uh, the crowd was chanting something. And the announcer said, the FCC won't let us, you know, the crowd is right, but the FCC won't let us repeat that or something. <laughs> yes. Also, um, my note for this is uh, Danielson needs to bring back cattle mutilation. I was actually, I was just going to mention that because that to me is a really funny name because of the fact that he's like super yes. vegan and, you know, anti-animal cruelty, which, you know, that's, uh, you know, I'm against animal cruelty as well. But like, you know, the fact that he's super, he he's that super vegan, I don't want to say hippie guy, but just the fact that that's the case and that he uses that as the name for his finisher. I thought that was yes. really funny. Yeah, and I, he uses it in every match on this list other than the two WWE matches I have. And uh, it, it looks like a legitimate, like, all right, I could buy that as being like a, a painful hold. Um so I, it just doesn't make any sense why he doesn't bring that back. Like it, that's a sweet ass vision or well, a visual. Well, now when he was in WWE, he used the diving headbutt as a finisher. Um, it's it's really more of a signature move. He uses the he calls it the LaBelle lock. Um, but it named after Gene LaBelle. But uh, WWE and their you know they just do what they do. They renamed it the Yes Lock. Okay. Uh, I can't think of what the what the move looks like it's 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 kind of a cross face type of deal okay i think uh that's that's kind of his main move and also like a running high knee which he kind of adopted from kenta now known as today otami right uh I, they don't really have a name for that uh sometimes it's called the knee plus drive by knee i don't know not like that's not like uh what's his name was it kenny omega not the same knee is it uh, it's similar. Uh, Kenny Omega calls it the V trigger. And of course it's, it's similar to, uh, Shinsuke Nakamura's Boma Ye, now known as the Kinshasa. That's its slave name. And what was it? Uh, cause even Seth, the, cause, uh, they were trying to get Seth Rollins to sort of be like the WWE Kenny Omega not too long ago. And they, cause they, all they, all Michael Cole kept yelling was the knee, the knee. Yeah. For, uh, this could be another <laughs> episode of, this could be an entire episode of wrestling renegades all right wwe's naming of things is irking me like you don't really have like catchy names for finishers anymore like uh you know it's it's official name what, what seth rollins was doing there is called the ripcord knee they couldn't even call it that you know kenny omega calls it the rain trigger because it's it's similar to kazuchika okada's rain maker um you could have given it any name at all and they're just like yeah it's a knee 
And bringing us all back around to the Daniel Bryan thing, that's why I think, yes, I agree with you. He needs to to bring back not only – I mean, they WWE won't let him call it the cattle mutilation, but he, need, they, he needs to bring it back, one, because like you said, it looks like a legitimate hold that would do some damage. And, I mean, if they could get away with using that name, it would be great, but we know they won't because even the uh, – Bamaye or whatever it's called, the the Shinsuke Nakamura move, which means, what does it mean? Kill him or something in another language? Yes. They, would, they wouldn't even use that because it's just like, well, what if what if Triple H's daughters Google that, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> my last note for the Danielson versus Samoa Joe match at ROH Midnight Express Reunion 2004 is, I miss Samoa Joe. <laughs> it's uh, supposed to be soon. Yes, and I cannot wait. But the point is, you know, I'm familiarizing myself with Danielson's pre-WWE stuff. You're getting your feet wet with his work in general. Uh, And I think uh, this was a pretty good first impression. Absolutely. 100%. And like you said, this is most of these matches that you chose were ones that could easily take place again but now in a WWE ring on that grander stage, sort of like one of the one of the main events this Sunday at WrestleMania is the Styles versus Nakamura match, which happened already, but it's just the fact that it's happening in a WWE WWE ring for the WWE title. And this this match, obviously this match, uh, Joe and Brian Danielson, Daniel Bryan, whatever you want to call him, uh, it wouldn't be exactly the same one because this is over 10 years ago what uh, almost two almost 20 years ago in a few years yeah. um but they could still go as unless Absolutely. unless something drastic happens and we see a huge change in style from uh the American Dragon this upcoming Sunday you know and knowing what we know we've seen Joe in a WWE ring and we know that he I mean yeah he got injured but we know that he could still go as long as the two of them can still go at a decent pace it won't be the same match but we know that they can both bring it and they could probably go the same amount of time this was an almost 40 minute match they talked about the fact that Ring of Honor has you know a 60 minute time limit on most of their matches at least title matches and uh so they they went you know, not that far off of the full hour. And if WWE were to let them just go, I have no doubt that they could make it. Even if they didn't set it as like an official Iron Man match, I have no doubt that they could make it go, you know, another 40, possibly 60 minutes, just the two of them. Right. And there were parts of this match where they picked up the pace, you know, so even if they only give them like 15 minutes, I think they could still make it work. Absolutely. Overall, I would give this match... Um, probably out of 10, I would probably give it an eight. Okay. That's fair. Um, so this was our first installment of chase the American dragon. Uh, we are hoping to do more of these in the coming days and release them throughout the week leading up to WrestleMania 34. Um, Paul, do you have anything to add? No, just, uh, check back on the clock shelves, YouTube page, follow clock shelves on Twitter and Instagram and all that to keep up to date with this show. Make sure to check out our podcast wrestling renegades. It and the other podcasts from the network will be linked in the description below. And actually this match will be the YouTube link will be linked in the description below. So you could check it out and you can uh, know what we're talking about. Excellent. And I am on Twitter at Uterus Memorial. No, uh, at Brain Strowman. Uh, you'll get that joke if you listen to our most recent Wrestling Renegades. Uh, so thanks, Paul. Uh, and I guess uh, check back for more Chase the American Dragon. All right. All right.